After 5,000 years, will the pyramids of Egypt reveal their secrets? Will this robot probe explain why the pharaohs created these wonders of the world? Did slaves use fantastic machines to build them? And did the ancient architects draw their inspiration from outer space? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communications satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. Many of the tombs and memorials in this Colombo graveyard are impressive reminders of past lives, but no monuments on earth are more awe-inspiring than the pyramids of Egypt. Before I saw them firsthand, I thought I knew what to expect, yet I was still overwhelmed. Endless nonsense has been written about these extraordinary structures. Some people believe the Great Pyramid carries coded prophecies about the future of our planet. Others, that a razor blade placed beneath one will be kept sharp by occult forces. But I've no time for pyramid idiocies. The last of the ancient world's seven great wonders conceal enough real mysteries to challenge the imagination. Only a few kilometers separate the pyramids of Giza from Cairo's modern center and the Nile. The short journey from the new world to the old is a must for Farouk al-Baz whenever he's in town. Like all Egyptians, this famous scientist is proud of his ancestors' achievements. They are so enormous, they are so impressive, we can't even perceive how these ancient people were able to build such enormous structures. And they're also beautiful structures. They're also located correctly as far as the north and south and east and west. They are also something that all of us still cannot completely fathom. The pyramids were built by the pharaohs, the kings who ruled Egypt nearly 5,000 years ago. The most important characteristic for the pharaoh is immortality. He wants to have a burial place that would stay for eternity. So they wanted to have something that would withstand all the forces of erosion, rain, and most importantly, wind. Dr. Elbaz searches the desert for water and other resources for the Egyptian government. He believes the pyramid builders learned from the landscape. After exploring in the western desert of Egypt for the last two decades, I have realized that the shape of the pyramid is the only thing that actually remains in this windy environment. Meaning that if the ancient Egyptians built that structure as a cube or a pentagon, it would have been long gone by erosion. In the Great Sand Sea, looking around, you would see absolutely nothing exists except sand and dunes for as far as I can see. However, every once in a while, you see a structure that is conical in shape or pyramidal in shape. I saw some that are four-sided, honest to God, pyramidal shapes, natural pyramidal shapes. I was exploring near the Kharga oasis, and in the distance, I see these three structures, almost identical to the view of what the pyramids of Giza are like that of Khufu, Khafra, and Mankara. I thought to myself, the ancient Egyptians must have learned that pyramidal structures are the only things that would persist in a windy environment, and when they wanted to build something that would persist forever, for eternity, they selected a pyramidal structure. 
A less earthbound solution to the riddle of the pyramid shape comes from a Belgian engineer. The blueprint fell from the sky, according to Robert Beauval. We know that they venerated a very, very sacred relic just before they started building pyramids, which was said to have cosmic origins and was of conical shape. Now, the likelihood is that this was an oriented iron meteorite. An oriented iron meteorite is a meteorite that enters through the atmosphere without turning, and therefore its front part burns off and has this unusual shape of a cone or a pyramid. Such meteorites are rarities prized by museums. This one is in Mexico City. New York guards another. Boval thinks a third must have hit ancient Egypt. The object, the, the sacred meteor, was so sacred that it probably gave the shape to the pyramid. So the pyramid, in sorts, is a symbol of this original relic. After the pyramids were built, this sacred relic, the sacred meteorite, disappeared. We really don't know where it went. And one of the likely places is that it might have been concealed within the pyramid. Even the secrets of the pyramid builders remain hidden. This stepped pyramid was their first design. Their second was less successful. Its sides were too steep and it cracked. The pharaoh rejected the bent pyramid and moved his builders to the site next door. Luckily for them, they got it right this time. The workers are usually thought to have been slaves. But in his excavations, Dr. Sahi Hawass, general director of the Giza pyramids, has unearthed a different story. He has found that the workers lived in a village next to the site. Every morning they passed through this gate on the way to their monumental task. Hawass's key discovery is the workers' graves. We are sure 100% of the classification of the people who are buried here through the inscriptions. It say uh, an inspector of building tombs, director of building pyramids, uh, and all these poor tombs are for the workmen. And you can imagine that for the first now, time now we know things about them. We know what kind of dress they had. Is like some of the workmen that you see working for me now. We know about the, their jobs for the first time. We found a, a unique title saying Emira Ges Mer, the overseer of the side of the pyramid. Means every side of the pyramid had someone to control it. In their underground tombs, the laborers' bones reveal that pyramid building was a back breaking task. The 600 skeletons that we found down in the cemetery there showed that all the workmen had stress on their back. They were involved in moving stones. They were doing a work, a hard work, to build the pyramid for the glory of the king. This discovery proved a very important thing, that building a pyramid was not by slaves. They are buried beside the king. If they were slaves, the king will never let them to be buried in his shadow. They are buried in the shadow of the pyramids. And that is an important proof that they were not slaves. Slaves or not, how did the workers actually construct such vast mausoleums? Okay, American engineer Robert Moores wants to find out how they could have lifted the stone blocks. If this works, it'll be a miracle, but uh, let's hope for the best. Okay, crew, we want to get on here. Easy does it. Let's see if we can raise this baby. An average pyramid block weighs more than two tons, but even this much smaller one takes some lifting. Okay, there she goes. To get Khufu's pyramid built, for example, in 20 years, uh, and I estimate it contains about 1.8 million blocks, working 10 hours a day, 300 days a year, you would have to be putting a block in place every two minutes. The ramp theories won't get those blocks in place. You just can't get enough blocks along one ramp or even four ramps to get the pyramid built in that time. 
Moore's favourite theory is that the Egyptians lifted the blocks with an A-frame. But to raise massive weights, A-frames must have been used in a more sophisticated way than this. Here's the block to be lifted, and as they, the workmen pull on this rope, the A-frame rotates, lifting the block. Now, at a certain point, other workmen on another rope that's attached to the block would take up the tension and hold the tension. Now the workman on the first rope could release the tension on the A-frame and take a new bite on the rope. Now they, the workman on the A-frame rope, could pull on the A-frame, rotating it again. We get up to about this height where the block is about to go over the lip. Both sets of workmen would haul on the rope to, to pull the block over the edge. And at that, at that point, Another A-frame up on the next level would start the process all over again. The only surviving description of how the pyramids were built comes from an ancient Greek historian. Herodotus reported that they were built with wooden machines. Teams of workers used them to lever the blocks from one step to another up the pyramid. One of these machines has been reconstructed from the ancient Greek description by pyramid enthusiast Bob Loudermilk. Here we have four lever operators, each of whom has a lever in either hand. Each lever requires only 34 pounds to be able to lift 275 pounds on this end. There's a 20 to 1 mechanical advantage. These four men using this machine could lift a block weighing approximately 5,000 pounds, a distance of probably two and a quarter feet, which is the average distance of the average step on the Great Pyramid, in probably 20 to 25 minutes. After they lifted the block and elevated it, then another man inserted cribbing from down below. Once the cribbing was in place, then the, the uh, block was allowed to settle back down on the cribbing. Every time the block was lifted and secured by these blocks that are placed underneath the block, underneath the, the large stone block, they could then shorten the, the chain and lift the block again until finally the block was lifted up so that it could be slid in to the next step. At home in Colorado, Loudermilk has begun practical tests. The Egyptians used around two million blocks to build the Great Pyramid. Loudermilk's machine is complicated and raises the block rather slowly. I've estimated that there were 16,000 machines. And uh, I'm guessing that approximately 570 blocks per day were delivered to the top of the pyramid using this system. Architect Julian Keeble has persuaded his family and friends to throw their weight behind his research. It is actually the moment of truth in a way because although we've worked all this out in theory, we've never actually lifted a block this big in reality. So. Ready? One, two, three, lift. Keeble believes the best way to lift a block is with simple levers. Ready to slip in a block, I hope. Yeah. OK, lower down. 23 seconds. Oh, we beat the record by two seconds, then. <laughs> Go. To get a pyramid built in a pharaoh's lifetime, experts have calculated that the Egyptians must have raised one block every two minutes. I'm finding it's hot work, actually. Are we ready? By timing each stage of the lift, Keeble's team discovers that it can't have been easy. Okay. 
So that's the tenth block. That means it must be one meter off the ground. The block itself is just under a meter high, so we've lifted it as much as the height of the block itself, which is actually more than we expected to do. So I'm very pleased that I think we've shown something in real life as to how what Herodotus described as being the way that pyramids were built can actually be done quite simply with four bits of wood. Farouk El Baz believes the pyramids themselves once provided the missing answers. One of the things that I've always wondered about is the fact that the uh, ancient Egyptians wrote down everything. So why don't we have the writing that would tell us about how the pyramids were built and what for and all of that? If we uh, look at the step pyramid, the first one that was built, we see it was based on a big structure like this, a smaller one on top, a smaller one on top, a smaller one on top. You make a pyramidal structure made by steps. So why change this pattern, since it proved right, into the pattern that we see today? I think it is the need for making a smooth surface so you can write the history on it, so it would stay forever. The pyramids, in today's terms, might be equivalent to the billboards on our highways to tell us about the greatness of such and such or the uh, virtues of our civilization. These were the virtues of the civilization then. There is one slight evidence that we can see today, and that is on the tip of the second uh, pyramid, right here, where we can still uh, see a piece of the outside uh, plaster. And on that plaster, we can still see a hint left over of the red paint that used to be on the outside. I believe that the whole outside surface was painted red, the Egyptian red, this magnificent color. And then on top of that is the writing from top to bottom, and all on the sides in columns like that going down the slope on all of the sides so everyone would be able to see the same story coming from all directions about who built the pyramid, what it meant, and when, and what for. Deep in the desert, at a tumble-down pyramid, Robert Beauval ponders the greatest question of all. This is where the ancient Egyptians left their Book of the Dead, it explains the pharaoh's philosophy. Although this pyramid may have seemed insignificant from the outside, inside here it's absolutely fantastic. Here is the key to understand the mystery of the pyramids, because they tell us of the mysterious star religion of the pharaohs. If you want to understand a cathedral, you of course read the Bible. So if you want to understand the pyramids, you must read these, the pyramid texts, the oldest religious writing in the world. And they repeatedly tell us how the king becomes a star to join his father Osiris in the sky. And Osiris is the constellation of Orion. So here, for example, we are told that the pharaoh is a dweller in the constellation of Orion. And in this passage here, we are told that the pharaoh is taken in the constellation of Orion. And repeatedly, over and over again, we are told that the king becomes a star. The king becomes a star and joins his father Osiris in the sky, in the special region of the sky where the constellation of Osiris is. This interpretation of the Book of the Dead says the pyramids are places of the night. In the pharaoh's burial chamber in the Great Pyramid, Baval finds confirmation. Tiny details point to the pyramid's purpose. The most mysterious structures are these shafts. In each chamber are two shafts, one in the north wall and one in the south wall. Now, although you see just a small opening, these shafts are extremely difficult to build. They're built within the core of the masonry at an incline. Now, this to an engineer, it's a nightmare because you have to not only cut each block and dress it properly, but the whole surrounding structure must be adapted. Each course of the masonry must be kept perfectly uh, dressed so to fit the, 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 the profile of the shaft. 
Originally, it was thought that these shafts were air shafts because when the shafts in the king's chamber were opened, they let air in. If they just wanted ventilation, it would have been much easier to have them horizontal. Whereas clearly, the architect went to a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble to build them. They must have a very, very important purpose. Only this robot camera could penetrate the shafts. German inventor Rudolf Gantenbrink calls it Upuaut, ancient Egyptian for opener of the ways. The robot was designed to be able to change its shape. It would need maximum contact with the shaft sides to propel itself over the unexplored terrain. There are four shafts inside the Great Pyramid, two upper shafts and two lower shafts. Everybody told me the lower shafts they will just go on for maybe two meters or eight meters and then they will stop. And, and I did never believe this. I said, we have the technology to find this out. So uh, uh, let's do it. Let's uh, make a robot. Let's go inside there and then we know better. From Gantenbrink's headquarters in the Great Pyramid, the robot set off into the unknown. It sent back pictures of its voyage. The first part of the shaft is horizontally for two meters, and then it goes up. So uh, just by looking with your eyes, you don't see what is coming there. We could see for the first time uh, images that have not been seen for 4,000 years. And this was the most exciting point. Upuaut explored all four shafts in the Great Pyramid. From the data, Robert Boval calculated the shafts would have pointed at particular constellations. He found that one of them was directly aligned with Orion's belt and could have launched the pharaoh's soul towards the stars. Boval goes even further. He believes the pyramid's grand design pays homage to the heavens. For years now, I've been trying to understand the strange layout of the three great pyramids of Giza. Now, the first two larger pyramids were in perfect alignment. And yet what was strange is that the third pyramid was not only much smaller, but was offset from this line. Now with all this precision, all this planning precision, why was that? I was totally baffled and yet I was sure it had something to do with the stars. Finally on a night out in the desert, I was sitting with a friend, a yachtsman, and he was trying to explain to me how to find the rising point of the brightest star in the sky, the dog star Sirius. And he pointed at the three stars in the belt of Orion. And he said, if you follow the line all the way down to the horizon, you will get the rising point of the star Sirius. And then, as if in an afterthought, he said, actually, if you look carefully, the three stars of Orion's belt are not quite in a row. The top star is much dimmer and is offset. And suddenly I realized that this was the answer I was looking for to explain the mysterious layout of the three pyramids of Giza. The whole thing fitted perfectly together. The Great Pyramid had the shaft as a launching pad for the soul of the dead king to Orion's belt. The three pyramids were a perfect representation of the three stars in Orion's belt. The Egyptians had made the cosmic link between heaven and earth. That wonderful old saying, man fears time, but time fears the pyramids, simply isn't true. The pyramids are a mere 5,000 years old, and that's barely one millionth of the world's age. Time has worn whole mountain ranges down to dust. I'm sure that in another 5,000 years, the pyramids will still be there, but they'll be showing their age. 
perhaps it looked like this virtual reality image generated in my computer. Here they are being overwhelmed by the forests of the late greenhouse era. And a few million years after that, if there are still any archaeologists around, some of them may argue that the pyramids never even existed. Thank <music> you.